Concerns are rising over whether Tokyo Electric Power Company has secured enough workers to decommission the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. New figures suggest the utility had earlier over-reported the number of workers it has on its payroll. NHK found through an interview with TEPCO officials that only 8,000 workers are registered for the job as of last month. The utility has estimated 11,700 workers are necessary for decommissioning work this year. It earlier said there would be no manpower shortage as it had secured about 24,000 workers. But this figure represents the total number of people who have worked at the crippled plant since the accident on March 11th last year. 16,000 workers have already quit the job. Many of them left due to severe working conditions. TEPCO officials say that some workers will register again and therefore there will be no employee shortage in the short term. But they also admit they cannot predict how many workers they can secure and also said they must train their workforce. 3,000 people a day are working on the unprecedented project. Their responsibilities include taking out nuclear fuel rods from three reactors which have melted down. And there's these guys. We took them camping for fun. It's another bullshit experiment. South Korea has ordered suspensions of two nuclear reactors to replace thousands of parts with fake warranties. The country's Knowledge Economy Ministry said more than 5,200 such parts are in use at five nuclear plants. It said eight parts suppliers have been fabricating warranties since 2003, but the ministry says the parts are not related to key functions of reactors. The government ordered the immediate suspensions at uh, the Yongwan nuclear power plant in the province of South Chola. Many of the parts are in use at the facility. The operator plans to replace them this year. Ministry officials say the suspensions may lead to unprecedented power shortages this winter. They say they will draw up an emergency energy saving plan for homes and businesses. Japan currently has only one operating nuclear plant. The country's nuclear regulatory body has put off a conclusion on whether a fissure under this plant is an active fault line. If the fault is confirmed to be active, the authority will ask the operator to shut down the plant. Five experts conducted a survey on Friday at the Oi plant in Fukui Prefecture. They examined the fissure that runs beneath the plant compound. A key pipeline that transports cooling water from the ocean to the reactors runs across the nearly one kilometer long seam. The Nuclear Regulation Authority panel was supposed to reach a conclusion on Sunday, but their views were divided. Toyo University professor Mitsuhisa Watanabe said, analysis of sediment above the fissure suggests it is active. I've concluded that an active fault exists. I don't see any need for a more careful evaluation. But Ritsume Kan University professor Atsumasa Okada pointed out that landslides can create fissures in strata. I can't decide at this point whether the slippage is a result of deep fault activity. Making a hasty conclusion is dangerous. NRA member Kunihiko Shimazaki said an active fault or landslides created the fissure and that is all the group can say at the moment. They decided to meet again on Wednesday to discuss the matter. The nuclear regulator will conduct on-site inspections at five other plants. Just another cold fact of life on this horrifying planet. The U.S. government has set up a special unit to control false rumors circulating on Twitter and other social networks in the wake of Superstorm Sandy. What the fuck? The Federal Emergency Management Agency set up the rumor control section on Saturday. Officials are working to dispel false information through its website and on an agency helpline. According to one rumor, thieves wearing power company uniforms were at large on the streets. Another claimed that anyone who lost power could receive food stamps. 
Such rumors circulated as restoration work got underway from Sandy, which struck the U.S. East Coast last week. False information also spread on social networks in Japan in the days after last year's quake and tsunami disaster. We have a storm system that is going to be forming along the eastern seaboard, moving northward and impacting the area that was just hit by Sandy. We're going to have all the details right here for you. I'm AccuWeather.com's Evan Myers, along with Elliot Abrams. Elliot, let's start off briefly with what's going on right now in Sandy's area. Uh, it's a chilly day today. You can see temperatures 10 to 15 degrees below normal. Okay, so let's take a look at this scenario. So the storm, as we said, forms down here, starts to move northward. Now, we have two possible tracks, divergent tracks, just like we had with Sandy. One, of course, took uh, Sandy out to sea, or a number of them took it out to sea, and a number more slammed it into the coast. Uh, this seems to be a more narrowly focused area, Elliot, rather than uh, what we saw with Sandy, which was anywhere from here, here to here, uh, several days out. Uh, you can see this track is much closer. Why don't you explain that and where well, we actually think it's going to go? It makes a big difference in terms of how much wind and how much rain on the coast, and also the possibility of snow. The leftmost track would be the windiest and rainiest along the mid-Atlantic coast and then into New England and offer the best opportunity or chance to have heavy snow in the Appalachian and central Pennsylvania through the Catskills and perhaps into the Green and White Mountains. The eastern track there would have less of all those things, perhaps no snow at all. So what we're looking at right now is what? Which of these tracks? Some place in the middle, a compromise, or more, more too close to the coast, more out to sea? Right now I'm thinking that it's closer to the coast, and the model that was best on the storm last week is the one saying that. Okay, let's take a look at what the potential wind gusts could be, and you can see this is a little bit darker purple here from uh, just south of Boston through Cape Cod, much of uh, Rhode Island, uh, and, and along uh, the eastern part of Long Island, coastal Long Island, of the ocean, and right along coastal New Jersey and Delaware. That doesn't look very, very pleasant, very happy for the folks down there that are cleaning up from Sandy. That's true, although those wind speeds in that lower category, many areas uh, in Pennsylvania experienced those winds when Sandy came through with the relatively minor damage. However, along the coast, replenishment operations are often done with the sand to replenish them during the winter months because of the winter storms that do so much erosion. There's been no way for that to have occurred in most places so far because all the attention has been on trying to help people recover. It's been just such a long recovery, so much damage, so much suffering that the normal things that would go on to protect the beaches can't be done yet. Now let's take a look, let's take a real close-in look here. So if in fact the, the storm is here strengthening and moving 
kind of like this, uh, the, the circulation around it in this manner means that we're going to be getting these winds in off the ocean once again. Now, we're not going to see a storm surge. You can get storm surges with non-tropical systems, but as long as it stays offshore out here somewhere, we're not going to get a storm surge. But, Elliot, we will get this piling up of the water as the winds blow from that direction across the ocean. So in this red area here along the New Jersey coast, what are we looking for? Additional beach erosion. The beaches are vulnerable to getting... Uh, to, to getting flooded once again. Also with all the debris hanging around, this will then be floating in some of the, the water and moving to other places. It's a mess made worse. Officials from more than 90 countries have renewed their call to abolish nuclear weapons. The UN Disarmament Committee adopted a resolution against the weapons and also urged North Korea to stop its nuclear program. Japan led the group of countries submitting the resolution. It urges member nations to take measures to achieve a nuclear-free world and to comply with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It stresses the importance of sanctions against North Korea. Pyongyang test launched a ballistic missile in April in violation of a UN Security Council resolution. North Korean officials claimed they were launching a satellite. 159 countries backed the resolution. Twelve countries abstained, including China and Russia. North Korea was the only country to vote against it. The international community should take every opportunity to press North Korea again and again. That will lead to success. Amano said countries with nuclear weapons backed the resolution, including U.S. and Britain. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you say there's no solution to the waste, but there is a solution to the waste, and the solution to the waste is to just leave it exactly where it is and to have somebody look at it for, for a million years, you know.